started, if you don't mind. Him you hear me? Is this on? Okay. Can I have your attention? We're going to get started, please. We uh, promised we'd get you out of here in two hours, so we're going we're gonna to start on time, if you will. Um, first of all, we want to welcome you to the first of what I think will be many uh, wastewater workshops. Uh, I think, as everybody knows, in the town of Howard, at least, this looks like a 40-year project plus. And um, a lot of things are going to happen over the next 40 years. A lot of things will be planned and then changed and will adapt, that type of thing. So on behalf of the Board of Selectmen, I want to thank you all for taking the time to be here, both those of you that are sitting at the tables and those that took the time to, to sit in the audience. Uh, we really appreciate it. I will say the topic of wastewater will dominate, dominate um, the discussions in Harwich for the next several decades to come. And as active members of our community, um, you should be the first ones to come in, get educated, have some feedback, input on the process, if you will, and become advocates for what's coming uh, in the wastewater plan. I will point out that we were notified last week uh, by, by David Young uh, that our comprehensive wastewater management plan has actually been filed uh, for the regulatory process. So that process is beginning. That's a major milestone, um, if you will, moving forward. So tonight we have, we have four speakers, um, and they will be introduced in a few moments. Uh, each of them is very familiar with the topic of wastewater and the issues facing Harwich. And what I ask from you is to listen, to learn, and participate, actively participate in the process. And, and you will see we have breakout sessions uh, coming at which we would challenge you to answer some questions collectively uh, as a group. And now it's my pleasure to introduce and turn over the workshop to Brian Dudley from the Mass DEP. Brian is here. He will lead this presentation and introduce over the course of time our speakers. Um, so Brian, with that, I'm gonna sit down and it's your show. Thank you, Peter. And welcome everyone. Um, I'm glad you could all make it tonight. I hope you got in dry. I didn't. Um, the purpose of tonight, tonight's meeting really, I think, is to bring everyone together so that we can all get on the same page with regard to wastewater planning and what the specific issues are. And just a little bit of housekeeping, the way it's going to proceed is that there will be four speakers sitting, they're all seated at, the, seated at the table here. And then we will be mercifully brief in our presentations so that there'll be plenty of time for the breakout sessions to address the questions that have been set before you. And you can see that all those questions are printed on a packet of, of papers that are at your tables. And there'll be the springboard for discussion. There'll be someone who will record the impressions, thoughts, suggestions that come out of those breakout sessions. And then we will have everyone report out and take all that information back and the town with their consultant will help consolidate those, those ideas that will further refine the final aspects of your wastewater management plan. So that's how tonight will proceed. And as Peter said, we are gonna try and get you out of here uh, in two hours or less if we can. Um, so, I'd like to introduce the first speaker tonight. Uh, he has worked with the DEP for a little bit longer probably than he wants to admit. And prior to that, he did work as a private consultant for uh, one of the larger CAPE firms in Falmouth, uh, design, doing site design, wastewater treatment plant design, water supply design, and, uh, and stormwater design. So he, ha he has lived on the Cape <coughs> since he was 18 um, and has seen a lot of changes and certainly has come to appreciate <coughs> the challenges that we face. So um, I would like to introduce Brian Dudley. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Tonight, I'd like to briefly talk about addressing nitrogen management and looking at it from 
a relatively basic introduction to the issue, moving on to what the options are for implementation and solutions, and then touching on some of the regulatory aspects that we all will be facing, not only in Harwich, but across the Cape. So the, I think the first question always is, why are we here? And primarily it's because nitrogen has become a major issue in terms of its impacts on our drinking water supplies, our resources, and if it were a simple problem to solve, then I think we all would have done it by now, but it's not. The so solutions are very complex, and not everyone has an equal level of understanding as to what the issues are, what the impacts are, and why controlling nitrogen is so important. So tonight is an attempt at least to try and get everybody on the same page if we can. As I mentioned, nitrogen does have impacts on drinking water supplies. Excess nitrogen can lead to what is called blue baby syndrome. It affects infants and it inhibits their ability to, uh, to carry oxygen through the bloodstream. Its official name is methemoglobinemia and it affects the hemoglobin. Um, nitrates have also had some linkage to some forms of gastrointestinal cancer, but those linkages are somewhat tenuous. And then from an environmental and resource standpoint, it does have significant impacts to coastal waters. There are two nutrients of concern in water chemistry, phosphorus and nitrogen. And the classic model is that nitrogen has more of an impact on coastal and marine waters, whereas phosphorus has more of an impact on fresh water. And we have seen across the Cape the impacts of nitrogen coastal embayments from a variety of different occurrences, such as algal blooms, which create mats of algae in the embayments that have aesthetic impacts, um, just both visually and as they decay, they create odors. But more importantly, we also see significant impacts in the form of fish kills. And they are not uncommon. And I think every town has experienced a fish kill in one form or another. So what are the sources of nitrogen? Well, we have wastewater, and that can come from septic systems and treatment plants. And because our means of addressing wastewater can be engineered, we consider that to be a controllable source. Fertilizers also contribute nitrogen. Our use of fertilizers, again, is something that we can control. Stormwater, runoff off from roads, runoff off of lawns, which contain fertilizers, contribute nitrogen in to the groundwater, which then finds its way into embayments, or in some cases, if you're directly on the water, it can go directly in as a, basically as a surface water discharge. That also is controllable. The sediments that build up as a result of plankton blooms, when you do get these algal blooms, eventually the algae die, they settle to the bottom, and that's where you get this thick, soupy muck that we've all experienced. I consider that to be semi-controllable because the algal blooms that result in the sediment can be controlled if we control the nutrient sources that perpetuate those algal blooms. And as we kind of choke off that plankton supply, then the sediments can start to feed on themselves and bacterially decay and eventually reduce the amount of sediment and muck 
that we see. So it's part a natural process, but part a controllable process. And then the final major contributor is atmospheric deposition. And because that travels in the air from jurisdictions outside of our control, we do consider it to be non-controllable unless we want to go to Cleveland and take over all their industries and prevent any of their atmospheric contribution that eventually drifts our way. So what are the options of solutions that we have? Well, we're trying to target a variety and there is no single solution that necessarily is the answer in any given situation. So we kind of have broken them up into what we consider to be traditional and non-traditional. And as you can see on the slide, our traditional approaches would be to target wastewater, which is the largest contributor, through individual septic systems, Title V systems, whether they be conventional systems, just a straight septic tank with a distribution system going out to a soil absorption system, or if we enhance on-site systems with more sophisticated treatment units, but still under the control of the homeowner, they may have some added benefit in terms of reducing nitrogen. We can look at cluster systems where we bring in multiple lots and treat them in a single system, and that can be done either under a larger Title V system or with some sort of treatment plant under a groundwater discharge permit. Or we can look at municipal treatment. And again, that's something that can either be done strictly within the boundaries and confines of the town itself, the communities themselves, or if communities want to partner with each other, there may be economies of scale realized by joining together and having a regional treatment plan. Then there are also what we consider to be non-traditional options for solutions. And some of these have already been looked at in the draft CWMP that had been submitted um, through the regulatory process a couple years ago. And we can take advantage of natural attenuation as groundwater moves through watersheds that are ultimately intercepted by ponds or creeks, there is some actual reduction of nitrogen within the creek beds or the lake beds. And we can take advantage of that. And that can help reduce the amount of engineered solutions that we may have to deal with. We can also look at improving flushing in different systems. And a great example of that actually just finished and, um, well, the culverts have been installed and now the, bridge, the bridges are being installed, so it's in the process of being finished, is Muddy Creek. Um, that is creating a whole new flushing regime where it's no longer choked off, but bringing in a lot of water from Pleasant Bay in a, in a more efficient tidal cycle. And that can help reduce the need for engineered solutions. And then there are others that are being pioneered now through town plans, looking at the benefits of using shellfish as a sort of in-stream treatment. We can look at permeable reactive barriers, which are essentially trenches that intercept groundwater and promote denitrification or nitrogen removal in the environment. And then floating constructed wetlands, which are exactly what they sound like. They're artificially created wetlands that can float within an embayment system and potentially achieve some level of water quality improvement. So for the implementation steps, Essentially, the normal course of events is to prepare a comprehensive wastewater management plan. Well, Harwich has already developed a draft plan and has just actually resubmitted the final plan in response to comments that were generated from that draft in the hopes that 
you'll be able to finalize the plan and then start moving towards concrete steps for implementation. And that plan looks at a variety of options. It's specific to Harwich's needs, but one of the great features of it is that it proposes potentially a partnership with Chatham. So as I was talking about partnering with communities and potentially achieving economies of scale, this is a good example of how that can be done. And discussions with Chatham are currently under, underway in order to be able to take advantage of some of the excess capacity that the new plant in Chatham has to help address some of Harwich's needs. And then a very important component of doing a comprehensive wastewater management plan is that an approved CWMP, a CWMP that is approved by the department, is a necessary component for um, qualification for a 0% interest loan under the state revolving fund. Otherwise, you'd be looking at a 2% loan. Now, 2% obviously is a great rate if you're, if you're financing your home, and it's a great rate if you're trying to finance a major capital project. But, as we all know, the higher the principal, the more interest you're going to pay. So by having a 0% interest loan, in some cases, that can be the equivalent of up to a 50% grant, because that's money you do not have to pay towards interest. And then there are other programs that have recently been enacted within the state revolving fund that potentially can allow for up to 25% of principal forgiveness, which is another huge financial incentive. And then I would like to just close briefly with the regulatory aspects of looking at this whole conundrum. Is it essentially because we're looking at degraded and impaired water bodies, it does fall under the state's regulatory purview in terms of protecting and maintaining our surface water quality standards. Now our goal has always been to work cooperatively with the towns so that we can move towards voluntary compliance. And in that light, DEP right now is looking at developing the framework for a watershed permit so that, again, it, it really tries to encourage communities working together to address watersheds as opposed to just addressing within artificial political boundaries of communities. Now, the way we're thinking about this, and we're still trying to develop it, is that it would be voluntary, but there would be incentives involved which would make it attractive to come in. And part of those incentives may be things like, instead of looking at a traditional 20-year planning horizon, we'd be expanding that out to a 40-year planning horizon, which can have implications on financing. However, while we have always wanted to work cooperatively with towns, we're running out of time to implement solutions. And we can't wait forever. And our patience won't last forever. So we do have the statute authority, statutory authority to require compliance. And that can be done through a variety of mechanisms one is that we can designate nitrogen sensitive areas and nitrogen sensitive embayments and that can bring with it stringent limits on on title 5 systems can bring stringent limits on individual lots that's not really the best way to go because i think it it's unfair and impractical to expect each individual lot to address and solve this problem. It's a community problem and needs to be addressed as a community. We can also create water pollution abatement districts, which essentially would mandate that action be taken. And there would still be some flexibility for the communities in terms of how they would want to implement that mandate, but it would be mandated and it would come with a specific timeline. 
Another option is to eliminate the Title V exemption from the groundwater <coughs> discharge permitting regulations. A lot of people think that Title V is the baseline for water quality and effluent limits. In fact, it isn't. The groundwater discharge permit regulations which affect any discharge greater than 10,000 are the baseline. But because it's impractical to meet the effluent limits expected under a groundwater discharge permit for flows less than 10,000, particularly for single family lots, those regulations do call out a specific exemption which allows for Title V. And then finally, what we all don't want is the fact that we live under the threat of third party lawsuits. I'm sure that many of you are aware of the conservation lawsuit, Conservation Law Foundation lawsuit against EPA that eventually resulted in the development of the 208 plan update performed by the Cape Cod Commission. Now a lot of people have said that with the advent of the 208, we have settled, or EPA has settled the lawsuit with CLF. It's not really the case. It's more that it's an abeyance. And the CLF is going to be looking very carefully at progress. And so it behooves us all to move expeditiously and in good faith so that we can keep that particular threat at bay because I don't think that they would hesitate to come in if they feel that progress isn't being made. And the problem with that is that if we look at a court-mandated solution as a result of a third-party lawsuit, you lose control, we lose control, and I don't think anybody wins because probably what ends up happening is a much more expensive solution than what we could have done if we worked together. So that's my brief introduction, I hope brief, introduction to the issues that we'll be talking about. And um, I would now like to introduce Patty Daly, who is the Deputy Director of the Cape Cod Commission. Prior to coming to the Commission, she was the Director of uh, Community Development in the town of Barnstable. Patty and I have uh, worked together a lot, both as in her role as a municipal official and in her role with the Cape Cod Commission. And I can certainly vouch for her good intentions and willingness to work with communities. So, Patty. Thank you, Brian. And good evening. Let's see if I can set this up for a short person. Um, so the, as Brian mentioned, the Cape Cod Commission was directed to develop a, uh, the 208 plan update, we call it. And it's called that because it's a plan that's done under Section 208 of the Clean Water Act, the U.S. Clean Water Act. Okay. The uh, Commission was directed to update the plan that was last done in 1978. Back in 78, we were really focused on issues around drinking water protection, so uh, leaking underground storage tanks and landfills and septic lagoons were uh, the issues that we were facing at that point. Um, when we were directed to update the plan, the state did give us $3 million to put that plan together, and that was completed uh, quite recently. Back in September, it was uh, approved by EPA, and it's been approved by DEP as well. So this new plan focuses on 21st century problems. So instead of, although we do still uh, have concerns about drinking water, uh, this plan was really focused on nitrogen and the impacts of nitrogen on, on our marine water quality, uh, which we've been seeing degrade over the last decade or so. So we worked uh, very closely with DEP and USC EPA in putting the plan together and um, I think some of the good outcomes of that work have been to broaden the types of solutions that communities can consider now, as well as looking at regulatory reforms. We maximize stakeholder involvement, so I know some of you were involved in our stakeholder process, which is very rigorous. 
Um, I think it was very successful. We actually had quite a bit of interest. People who started that stakeholder process stayed with us through the whole process and, and really followed us and gave us great input as we went along. And we also recognize that uh, many of the towns, such as Harwich, have been working on this issue for quite some time, so made an early determination that we're going to build on these early efforts of the towns and try to bolster them and make it easier for communities to move forward. So some of the outcomes of the 208 plan update are that the, um, the towns have been designated as waste management agencies, and that's a term of art under the Clean Water Act, and WMAs, or waste management agencies, are essentially those entities responsible for implementing water quality improvement projects. Uh, one thing we agreed to do, also as part of 208 by the end of this June, is to come up with watershed plans Cape-wide so we can begin to knit together all of the efforts of communities and where towns haven't been working as closely on some of these issues, the Commission's going to step in and put those uh, watershed plans together for them. And again, as um, Brian said, we're looking to submit plans that show collection system or sewer options and non-collection system or some of those more natural system options going forward. And we will be submitting an implementation report uh, to DEP and EPA in July of this year, reporting back on how we're pulling together all this planning, planning efforts. So when we were looking at the universe of solutions here, um, typically what towns were doing was going straight to a sewer. They'd look at IA systems, they'd look at a sewer solution, and we wanted to broaden the um, options that were available to towns because some, some options may be less expensive and achieve, achieve the same goals. So what we've done is break in all of the technologies that we could pull together into reduction, remediation, and restoration strategies. So reduction is something that stops the nitrogen before it hits the uh, groundwater, like a, su a sewer system. It goes into the pipe instead of into the ground. Uh, remediation is something that intersects the groundwater on its way to the embayment and removes nitrogen at that level. And then restoration is a technology you would, it would install in the embayment itself, um, like an inlet widening, for example. And then we put them on a site scale, neighborhood, watershed, and Cape wide scale. Um, so this is really our one page graphic of the universe of technological solutions available. So um, in Harwich, and this is part of one of the appendices in the 208 plan. This is your town. I'm not sure why the rest of the Cape isn't showing up. But let's go to the next slide. <laughs> you can see it on Charlene's screen. It's on here. It's here. It's in the, that's right. It's in the handout. Thank you. Must be an off yeah. point or something. Sometimes it washes out on the screen. <laughs> um, so here are your watersheds uh, superimposed over the town. And then the next slide shows the shared watersheds, which are going to be Herring River, uh, Pleasant Bay, um, Swan Pond a little bit. Um, so across the Cape, like two-thirds of the nitrogen-sensitive embayments are shared among towns. And one of the things we wanted to do with 208 was create some incentives for towns to work together to try and find maybe what might be more cost-effective options moving forward uh, if we're working together instead of just within town boundaries. So and um, here's one of your shared watersheds, Pleasant Bay. We've also um, gone ahead and identified each town's share and each shared embayment for their percent responsibility for nitrogen removal. So we've done this using an uh, MEP, a mass estuaries project methodology but we've applied updated water use data so that we can uh, uh, move forward from some of those past efforts, use the most up-to-date data possible, and assign responsibility. These are our best guess at these numbers, or our estimation, I should say, of these numbers, but uh, we are open if towns think that those numbers need to be adjusted to working with you all to uh, make those improvements or corrections. <coughs> Excuse me. So I mentioned um, regulatory streamlining. 
we really are promoting targeted watershed plans so that um, if you have a solution in a particular watershed that's like ready to go, you've got consensus, that the town should be able to move forward with that without having to wait for your whole uh, comprehensive plan to be put together. Now, in, in this case, I congratulate you all for having your CWMP done. In some towns, that's not the case, and we didn't want towns being held up if they do have a solution identified. Um, we've I argued for and I think uh, achieved the ability for towns to take reduction credits for fertilizer and stormwater efforts, uh, which you ne couldn't necessarily do before. And then the watershed permit that Brian described is another way to promote shared efforts among towns and watersheds. Um, this we call affectionately the wiring diagram. So this is uh, intended to show what an adaptive management plan uh, looks like. And if you look down the left, you see the different technologies um, that might be employed. And then the years across the top in five-year increments. So in some towns, uh, they are uh, looking to use some of these non-traditional technologies. Let's try a PRB and some aquaculture, let's say in a particular embayment. They'd have five years to kind of pilot those, um, see how they're working. If they are working, great, they go ahead with a green arrow towards the right. If they're not working, the town reconsiders and might need to uh, fall back on a sewer um, option, for example, or a different kind of non-traditional technology. So this, again, is intended to create some space for flexibility uh, for communities to pursue the options that they prefer, while also ensuring that we've got our eye on the prize at the end of the day. Uh, I mentioned the stakeholder process a little bit. I won't. Um, dwell on it too much, but affordability, flexibility, um, agreement and engagement were a, a big part of that and we hope to um, bring that into the local process as much as possible, uh, particularly where communities are not in agreement about how to move forward. Uh, you can just click four times. Yeah. So the cornerstones of the plan for the region to help towns is assisting with information, uh, technical support, regulatory reform, and cost efficiencies or methods of making um, this process as affordable as possible. 28 looks to simplify the process. Again, uh, we are offering technical assistance. We have watershed teams. We've met with your consultant, Dave Young, several times um, to coordinate with him going forward. Uh, increasing regulatory flexibility and providing access to financial resources. For the first time, EPA is putting money into the Cape Cod region in the form of grants through their uh, uh, Southeast New England program. And most of that money has been going towards uh, PRB investigation, permeable reactive barrier investigation, but um, we do hope to see more federal money coming into the region. Uh, considering collection and treatment areas where it's most uh, appropriate is going to help lower costs for communities. Broadening the use of those non-traditional technologies um, will also help in some instances. And cost sharing results um, where communities are working together to build infrastructure to address nitrogen should also help to lower costs for all Cape Cod residents. <laughs> and I just want to mention um, broadly that um, I think it's been, it's been great for the town of Harwich that Larry Ballantyne's been chairing the Cape Cod Water Protection Collaborative. It's really ensured that um, we've had a close relationship with your town as you've gone through the planning process. And uh, uh, also wanted to mention that I think this town has done a great job of communicating the options around how to pay for these solutions that are, are going to be expensive. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Um, our next speaker is Dave Young from CDM Smith, um, and he is going to provide an update on the status of the CWMP and what the engineering aspects will be moving forward. Dave has been with CDM for about 35 years, and every time he tells me that, I say, Dave, did you start when you were 12? But he's older now, so I now have to say, 
Did you start when you were 13? So without any further ado, here's Dave Young. I have to tell Brian I have to even update that one, but we'll let that go. Uh, welcome, everybody. I see some new faces out here, which is great. I also see some faces out here that started with us in 2007, which is when this process began, and we had the opportunity to start working with Harwich, uh, who could probably give this presentation, uh, Larry being one. Um, so what I'd like to do is you've heard the regulatory perspective uh, and then you've heard what the Cape Cod Commission has been doing to help communities. I'd like to bring it in on to focus now for you. I'd like to talk about the Town of Harwich's plan, what you've been doing, what the issues are, and go from there. Uh, this is the committee that we've been dealing with uh, most recently, Wastewater Implementation Committee. Uh, they put a lot of time and effort in. We've appreciated all their input. Um, a lot of other people who aren't listed on that slide have also been uh, key players in this as well. So it's truly been a, a partnership with the community. My presentation is going to focus on three areas. One, what is the issue for Harwich? You've heard a little bit about it. I'd like to bring it directly to Harwich. What are the solutions that have been evaluated? And then what's your overall recommended plan program? Um, as you heard earlier, Selectman Hughes indicated we've actually filed your final comprehensive wastewater management plan last week uh, with the uh, state regulators and the Cape Cod Commission, so that's moving forward. Next. So what is the issue? Well, I always like to start with this slide because uh, uh, it's the old picture tells us the story. Uh, you can see the growth that has occurred in Harwich over the last 50 plus years. Uh, all you got to do is look at the color coding. Uh, green means it wasn't developed. Yellow and red means it's become developed. Quite a difference. Over 400 percent population increase and even though those pictures are taken off the Woods Hole uh, actual planning slides, um, you know, it's still a few years old. Your population is around that. I bet many of you in this room moved to Harwich during that time frame. Some of you have been here your whole life, but you all contribute to the problem that we're going to talk about. Why is there a focus on the Cape? You say you, you, other parts of the state don't hear this, other parts of the country. Uh, well, it's truly that statement sort of summarizes it. You have Cape Cod represents 4% of the state of Massachusetts population but you have over 20% of the septic systems. Believe it or not, there are only four municipalities who actually have a wastewater treatment plant that they operate here on the Cape. Falmouth, Hyannis, Chatham, and Provincetown. All the others are like yourselves, essentially starting from ground zero. So what is the issue with all that increased growth? Everybody for the most part, there are some other systems, but for the most part, you all have a Title V septic system. Title V septic systems were designed to remove solids and bacteria. They were not designed to remove nutrients, mainly nitrogen. You might get, if under the ideal conditions, a 15, 20 percent removal of nitrogen. Uh, that's probably on the high side. So nitrogen flows right through that septic system down into the groundwater table. Right here, this is the house, septic tank, leaching field flows down to the groundwater table, groundwater flowing this direction out to the saltwater embayment. You're going to hear two things tonight, if you can take these away. Nitrogen impacts saltwater, phosphorus impacts freshwater. Both of them can come from your septic system. Another term that's been tossed around here tonight is watershed. Some of you may know what a watershed is, some not. In very brief terms, a watershed, this is an outline of the Herring River watershed. You heard Patty Daly say it's a shared watershed. Well, this is the town line between Dennis and Harwich, and this is the town line right here between Brewster and Harwich. So you can see Dennis Port is actually in the Herring River watershed, and portions of Brewster are in the Herring River watershed. It's one of the largest watersheds here on Cape Cod. 
What does that mean? That means that a drop of water right here that falls from the sky or a septic system that puts water into the groundwater table right here, all outlets right here. Same with if you're over here or if you're up here in Brewster. That means anything collected in that watershed outlets in the uh, Herring River right here. Similarly, smaller watershed, you've got the Allen Harbor watershed. It's all collected in here. So if you're on the north por portion or out here on, near the ocean, it all outlets right there. So everybody that's in that watershed contributes to the issue that's in that watershed. Next. You've heard MEP thrown around tonight. We're great with acronyms, aren't we? MEP stands for the Massachusetts Estuaries Project. Uh, that was the study that's been done to evaluate what all the nitrogen impacts are here on numerous embayments uh, on Cape Cod in those watersheds. And that was done by the Mass Department of Environmental Protection, uh, provided a lot of the funding. Uh, the science technology aspect was done by UMass Dartmouth, a person by the name of Brian Howes uh, led that effort. Uh, the communities provided a lot of the water quality data, three years of water quality data collected, uh, fed into the programming and computer models that then simulate the whole um, watershed from what gets applied to how the whole interaction is. Uh, and then you get all the monitoring and everything that's done. They issued a report for each of these watersheds. So you have five of them that have been issued. I'm going to forget that 1% that's in Swan Pond for the moment. <laughs> uh, mainly being Herring River, Pleasant Bay, and then they issued one report for Allen, Wichmere, and Sacquatucket because all three of those smaller watersheds are contained within Harwich. So back to the issue. What, why are we talking about nitrogen? Well, as you heard Brian Dudley say, you get the nitrogen and phosphorus when you get too much. And that's what's determined in those Mass Estuaries Project reports or MEP reports. They tell you whether you have too much or whether you're below a threshold for a healthy environment. So if you have too much, you get nuisance algae, which depletes the amount of oxygen, creates poor aesthetics. Uh, you get loss of habitat, fish kills, uh, unhealthy you know, um, organisms living in the bottom. And what's that do? That's when it starts to impact you. It's your quality of life, impacts your, pro your property values. You live in a tourism economy, impacts that, the whole economic vitality of the community. Sort of pictorially, because I know it's tough to envision what the words mean, this is a healthy environment. And this is sort of washed out as well. I think it's a little bit better in your handout. But again, uh, if you get sunlight that can penetrate the water, which is all washed out here in the white, you get to go out, kayak, and enjoy that beautiful environment. That's the type of water quality you want. That's why you've moved here to the Cape. Back one more. And so you've got, you don't have unlimited algae growth. You've just got a healthy environment, uh, amount of it for fish to feed on. Uh, you've got what's known as eelgrass and other healthy uh, organisms living in the, the bottom sediment. So it's a healthy environment. Next. Oh, the other way. If you end up with too much, the sunlight doesn't penetrate because you've got too much algae. It's blocking the, the healthy uh, sunlight getting in, so you deplete the oxygen levels. Uh, you start to get decay from bacteria falling to the bottom. You notice the eelgrass is gone, and this is what you end up with, not what, something that you want to kayak on. Next. So what happens then is from the MEP reports, Agencies like the Department of Environmental Protection, working with the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, take that data and they issue what's known as a total maximum daily load or a TMDL permit limit for that watershed. 
what that is is the amount of nitrogen for the saltwater embayments, and they can issue them for freshwater ponds as well, which would be the amount of phosphorus that is acceptable to create a healthy environment. If you've got too much of that nitrogen going in, too much above that TMDL, you have to remove it. And that's the permit that Brian Dudley was talking about. You actually have a TMDL that's been issued for Pleasant Bay, and they're in the process of issuing them for Herring River and Allen, Wichmere, and Sacquatucket. They actually sit at EPA now. They held the public hearing last fall or last summer here in town uh, to get comment. But essentially, it's all the information that comes out of those Massachusetts Estuaries Project reports. Oh, yep. As you can see, again, a little bit washed out, but you know, you've already had impacts to your freshwater ponds and to your saltwater estuaries. Being Allen Harbor, you can see the green color. This is Hinkley's Pond. Uh, bigger picture, you can see Long Pond, which you did a cleanup with the town of Brewster about four or five years ago. Uh, a little tough on this one, but that is actually a nice blue. This is a pea soup green. Uh, so you're having impacts from phosphorus on Hinkley Pond, and you're having impacts to your embayments already. One of the other things that they look for, and you can tell whether you're having impacts on your embayments, is eelgrass. Again, that would grow if you had a healthy environment on the bottom. DEP does aerial flights on a regular basis to track through, from the airplanes looking down, the amount of eelgrass and the amount of acreage of eelgrass. Think of eelgrass as the canary in the mine. If you have plentiful amounts of eelgrass, you have a healthy water quality. If you're losing eelgrass, your water quality is degrading, and if you have no eelgrass in that area, pretty much the water quality has degraded. So, looking back in 1995, this is the Harwich shoreline. You had plentiful amount of eelgrass. 2001, you can see you started to lose some up in here. And the most recent, 2010, 2013, you have very little eelgrass left. So over that time frame, your water quality in that area has significantly degraded. Next. Ooh. Well, that one washed out. Uh, that is in your handout. Uh, it's on page eight of my presentation. Many of you are familiar with this. This is uh, what's known as, and if you can see them, this is your water, uh, where your water comes from. We not only look at when we're doing the comprehensive wastewater management planning, just the nitrogen impacts to your embayments, but we also looked at any potential impacts to your drinking water wells, as well as impacts to your freshwater ponds. So this is where your wells are located. Uh, in this area right here, uh, and over here off Depot Road, uh, and then this is up at Pleasant Bay, and then more recently you've been doing them um, up in the northwest corner of town. Uh, if you look at that figure, you see some yellow areas. That's actually where, on a daily basis, the water comes from. The pink areas on the figure show where the water could come from under a six-month drought condition. So it's a much larger impact area. So the focus is really on the yellow as to what you're pumping. Next. Uh, this doesn't quite show the colors that are in your uh, handout, but I think you get the gist of there's different colors. The different colors mean different water quality uh, and the status of those freshwater ponds based on what we've been able to look at from available water quality data. Uh, as you can see up there, Hinkley Pond, which we just showed you uh, clearly, <laughs> excuse me, is a degraded pond. Uh, and you have some others. You have some that are very good. They've been very well protected. So again, just something that needs to be monitored. So what are the solutions? Now that we've talked about some of the issues, what are the solutions? That's where the comprehensive wastewater management planning process came in. This is where we started to look at the whole host of solutions. Uh, you saw Patty Daly put that matrix up, which we'll talk about in a minute. But as I said, we talk about 
what the impacts from nitrogen are. That's using the MEP information. We looked at your freshwater pond quality, the phosphorus issue. We looked at your drinking water wells, nitrogen, and um, contaminants of emerging concern, known as CECs, which will be the next bigger issue. Uh, Title V issues, where you're giving waivers due to high groundwater, small lots. Um, and then, where do you want to encourage smart growth to have socioeconomic benefits to the community? So those are all considered in the plan. You heard earlier from Brian, you know, what are the controllable sources of nitrogen? You know, how do we go about identifying where the nitrogen's coming from and how do we remove some of it in those embayments that have too much? Well, we focus really on the three largest controllable sources. As you heard, you know, we're not going to be able to control the power plants in the Midwest, so the atmospheric deposition of nitrogen, we really consider that non-controllable. So we focus on wastewater coming from your septic systems. Uh, so that's typically in the 80, 85% range for most of your watersheds, varies a little by watershed. And then the fertilizer, 7 to 8%, and stormwater components. The recommended plan ultimately calls for you to do education for your fertilizer management, and as the town's already doing, to implement best management practices as you do road work uh, so you're not having direct runoff of stormwater into water bodies. You're putting it into the ground first. Next. You saw this uh, in Patty's slide. You know, again, this is just the whole host of options. The town, when they filed their draft plan back in 2013, had already looked at many of these. When we've done the most recent update, we went back and re-looked to make sure that we hadn't missed something, uh, getting input from the committee. Uh, on that whole host of options. Uh, as you can see, it's based on uh, site, meaning on-site, neighborhood scale, watershed basis, and then Cape Wide. And then you look at, over here, you look at prevention, meaning not putting it in the ground, treating it prior to, uh, reduction, treating in that um, groundwater, and then this is out remediation. It's already been degraded. Now you have to remediate it to restore it back to water quality. And then, I know it's difficult to read this, uh, probably difficult to read in your handout, but you know, this gets into things like urine diversion toilets, all the way up through the permeable reactive barriers that have been discussed, and we'll talk a little bit about those. The committee felt that some of the on-lot systems and going back and looking at it, that the culture of Harwich, that on a wide scale basis, things like urine diversion toilets would not be appropriate, so that was not looked at in significant detail, uh, but we did focus on a lot of other items and we'll get into that in a minute. Again, this shows up much better and there's a board over near uh, where you picked up your handouts uh, tonight. This shows the amount of nitrogen needing to be removed by septic systems in each of those watersheds. Significant amount. If you're looking at the Herring River watershed, which I said was this whole area, you know, you're looking at 58% of the septic systems would need to have the nitrogen removed. Down here, Allen Harbor, 78%. Uh, Witchmere Harbor, 68%, or excuse me, 100%, and Sacquatucket, 68%. And then you're over here, 65%, excuse me, 58 and 65. Significant amount of nitrogen. So that started to limit what types of solutions we could actually look at. Next. So this graphically presents some of the amount of nitrogen that certain solutions would remove. So that started to help the town focus on what types of options to look at. As I said, a typical Title V system wasn't designed for nitrogen removal. Under ideal conditions, you can probably get the 15 to 20 percent removal. An innovative alternative system, 40 percent. Some of the newer ones probably get up a little higher, 50 percent or so. You start to collect more wastewater, do a neighborhood solution, whether it's a centralized package plan or an IA, you can get up into the 60, 70 percent range. You collect more wastewater where you can feed those bugs on a regular basis, have more control you start to get up into the 90% range. 
So that started to focus. If you have to remove 65% of the nitrogen, you know, you start to limit what solutions you can look at. So using that information back in the draft plan, uh, the town developed these eight alternatives that were evaluated in detail. Uh, cost issues, environmental issues, institutional permitting, uh, and ultimately the one that was focused on was this alternative 5A. And what I'll do now is actually walk you through that. Uh, but those options here, they looked at anywhere from all innovative alternative systems on everyone's lot, which didn't get us enough nitrogen removal in some instances to looking at ocean outfalls, which became just way too costly to do, uh, for a, particularly for a single individual town. Next. So what's the recommended plan for Harwich? Again, there's a board behind there. Uh, it's been in town hall. It's been here in the community center for many months. Uh, this plan, which again, I apologize, it's washed out, shows the eight phases that the town has developed for uh, implementing their wastewater program. Each phase about five years. That would allows for funding, design, and construction of that phase. Most of this is for uh, sewering these specific areas. Um, and that 5A was a two treatment plant option, which we'll walk through some of the details now. But the first phase focused on sort of the non-infrastructure options or the natural nitrogen attenuation options. Uh, you've heard a little discussion earlier, the Muddy Creek option. This is looking upstream of Muddy Creek, so the new bridge would be over here. Uh, that project is going well, we've received a lot of uh, significant funding. Uh, Pleasant Bay Alliance has been significantly uh, involved with that, working with Chatham and Harwich to acquire funds. Going very well, should be done in the end of May, June. Uh, so we look forward to that. That saved the town of Harwich from having to sewer over 200 homes, that project. So tremendous cost benefit ratio. Next. Uh, we're also in the process of completing a natural nitrogen attenuation study of the uh, former cranberry bogs, uh, the Cold Brook stream down off of Bank Street. Um, we're looking at the potential and have been talking to the Harwich Conservation Trust folks who own this site to see if we can't increase the amount of naturally nitrogen removal. Uh, most of the time when you go through a freshwater pond, you get 50% removal. Because we don't have ponds here, we're only getting 35% removal based on the sampling they've done. So we're looking to see whether it makes sense to try to either increase the residence time of the stream that flows through there look at the option of actually creating another pond where one of the cranberry bogs used to be or what other options we might be able to look at. Again, as a simple or a simpler way, more cost effective way of trying to remove that nitrogen. Uh, but as you saw, the first phase, the second and third phase are actually called for sewering the Pleasant Bay watershed area uh, and sending the wastewater that's collected over to the Chatham wastewater treatment plant. That's that community partnership that you heard earlier. Uh, 300,000 gallons of capacity is currently in the process of being negotiated for an intermunicipal agreement with Chatham. Uh, and that would take care of the wastewater collected in phases two and three up in the Pleasant Bay watershed. Why that watershed? It's actually the largest watershed that has the highest percent nitrogen removal required. Uh, it also has two municipal drinking water wells that are well, well below any threshold of threat are the wells, the only wells that have shown any impact from nitrogen uh, in the town. So we want to make sure that that doesn't get any worse. And it's also the area where you are looking at some smart growth um, uh, options there as well. So that's why that was put up first. And then the other options would be done after that. The town already does some shellfish uh, aquaculture. We encourage you to continue doing that. You've been doing it in these four harbors. 
So while there is no specific aquaculture program in the wastewater plan, you should continue doing this because you get benefit. Uh, aquaculture allows you to remove nitrogen. It's absorbed in the shellfish and into the shells themselves, which then become removed. Next. Phase four is when you would build your own, your internal, in-town wastewater treatment plant to handle the rest of the community around 1 million gallons per day of flow, and it's proposed to be built at the, uh, off Queen Anne Road, near the uh, Harwich DPW. Uh, the bike trail is right here. So it's over in this uh, large wooded parcel. Uh, that's where you would treat, build a treatment plant and recharge the effluent at that site. Next. And then as future phases of uh, sewers were put in, you would uh, send the wastewater to that site. Uh, we're also proposing to put a permeable, what's known as a permeable reactive barrier around the effluent recharge site there. So as you pour the treated effluent in the ground, it would be uh, encapsulated and circled by that barrier where as the water flows through it, it would further reduce nitrogen, minimizing impacts to any of the down gradient or downstream uh, groundwater where the groundwater flows and daylights into any ponds or ultimately the Herring River. Next. Most recently the town has actually been involved in some discussions with the towns of Dennis and Yarmouth as a further community partnership. So you're looking at Pleasant Bay with Chatham We've actually been having discussions with Dennis and Yarmouth about instead of building that second treatment plant in Harwich, you send the wastewater to a treatment plant that would be built in Dennis at the Dennis DPW, a little under three miles further down Queen Anne Road, and then bring your F1 back and recharge it here. By three communities building one treatment plant, there's some significant cost savings due to economy of scale. So it's something that's just started, very preliminary discussions, but we did want to make sure that that was uh, brought up. Next. So where does the program stand? As we indicated, the Comprehensive Wastewater Management Plan has recently been filed. You've already done a lot of the work in uh, phase one, Muddy Creek. Uh, you're under negotiation with Chatham, um, Colebrook, natural nitrogen attenuation studies ongoing. So those were four of the five items that were listed in the uh, phase one program. So you're well underway. You've started. What's next is to get the comments on the final plan and then go through the Cape Cod Commission's development of regional impact, which will probably take about six months. Uh, and then, as uh, Brian indicated, you would be qualified for any of the uh, state revolving fund loan programs. Uh, and the TMDLs are in the process of being finalized as well. Next. We've used this slide previously, some presentations. Um, it's opened some eyes. Most people have sat out there, and this is sort of a lead in to the next speaker's presentation, because most people have said, how are we ever going to afford a 180 to $220 million program? You've already done it. This is the Harwich Water Department. Took them 50 years to get there, but you build 180 miles of water mains, get over five pumping stations, three storage tanks, more than one treatment plant now, I think, and all your other capital improvements. You've used multiple funding mechanisms to do it, and you've survived, and you have an excellent water system. So you can do your wastewater program over a similar time frame. Just to show that Harwich isn't the only one in this predicament dealing with this issue, uh, you have, you know, Allen Harbor, but we're also showing Swan Pond and Mill Creek in Yarmouth. Your neighbors are wrestling with the same issues because they've all undergone that same growth and they all are on Title V septic systems. Next. Just to summarize, you know, this, this 
Issuing a final comprehensive wastewater management plan doesn't mean that we take that report and sit it on the shelf. It's a very thick report. By the way, it's in the process of being uploaded to put on your website, and um, some copies are being put in the Brooks Library for anyone who wants to sit there and try to fall asleep and read it. Uh, the executive summary has been floating around electronically, but all that will be uh, loaded onto your town's website, so it'll be available for anyone to read. But it's not a one-time document. It's a living document. It's something that constantly has to be referred to and updated. It's got a lot of flexibility built into it. I gave a range of 180 to 220 million dollars. Why is that? Well. If you go out and pursue one of your recommendations, acquire some open space. Take some future growth, nitrogen impacts off future roles. That's a cost savings. If you do very good on your fertilizer education program and you get more than that 25% credit, that's less sewering you have to put in the ground. <laughs> Blake Cooper does a super job, which I know he will, on his best management practices dealing with the stormwater in town more cost savings. All those need to keep being revisited. There's a test center down at the Otis Air National Guard that's constantly doing uh, analysis of other on-site systems to see if they can do what's called passive nitrogen removal to further enhance nitrogen systems before having to do sewers. Need to keep up with all those things. So it's, it's a living document. I, just, I can't overemphasize that enough. Um, and hopefully when you start implementing all this, your water quality will continue to improve. So I think that's it, right? So with that, thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, next speaker needs no introduction to any of you. Um, it, he's your own town administrator, Chris Clark, and he is going to talk about cost recovery and finances. <coughs> Thank you and good evening. I wanted to talk a little bit just about how we got to where we are and what's the process that's been followed. So can we click? First off, there's a uh, wastewater implementation committee that has done the job of trying to figure out what do we want to do in terms of, I think you've, you've heard the problem outlined pretty clearly, and how do we want to pursue trying to pay for that? So the wastewater implementation committee put forth and, and actually has been dealing with a program that's going to be implemented, as you've heard, over eight phases, and it's going to occur over a 40-year time horizon. And many variables will change over that time horizon. I do want to kind of emphasize that a little bit. The focus is on a cost recovery model in the first three implementation stages. I think it's kind of when you're looking at a 40-year time horizon, if you look at the first three stages, that gives you a, a blueprint to kind of work off of the foundation. So we looked at the first three phases as the, as the main component. And then thirdly, they wanted to keep the cost model simple. So that's one of the things that I think they've been successful in doing is to come up with a cost model that's simple, that's something that could be pursued. A couple of the ideas that they came up with. The first is, is that the second one? Or did you jump me? Okay. In terms of the strategy, uh, they looked, we, we did this strategy. Yeah. Yeah. strategy. Second strategy. <laughs> I was worried about having maps that are gonna get washed out, but I don't have any maps in my presentation. In terms of the, uh, the strategy, I think one of the things that they took into account was that everyone contributes to the nitrogen problem, so everyone should help in the pay, to pay for the restoration of the water quality. And I think that's important. How do we accomplish that? The second was to develop a dedicated funding source that will help stabilize costs of the program over time. And then the third is to include a component that links water use, such as the nitrogen contributed, to the amount a resident or business owner pays. Generally you do that through water flow. The amount of water that's used usually goes back into the environment in the form of wastewater. They came up with, the, the committee came up with basically three elements. One was an infrastructure investment fund, very similar to a CPA type additional taxation that's allowed by Mass General Law. That would be a local acceptance that you could go up to 3%. So that would be a funding mechanism. When I did some preliminary modeling, that will not generate sufficient funds to, to meet the needs that the town has to meet. So that would not be 
the sole factor that we would use to try to meet this challenge. The second one is a town-wide property tax. We see this all the time in terms of the last couple of years that I've been here. Unfortunately, we've had capital exclusions and debt exclusions on the ballot. This would take the form of debt exclusions. So as we do specific programs, as we do specific parts of the program, we would put them up for debt exclusion. You see actually that we had the, uh, the Chatham IMA was something that we were going to discuss that was going to be $9 million. We have not reached final agreement with Chatham, so that has been delayed for this town meeting. But that's still something that we are actively looking at as, been, as has been pointed out. And then the third is to create a sewer enterprise fund that whatever revenue is generated out of the sewers would stay within that enterprise fund and allow us to use that money to mitigate the program. A lot of that, the sewer enterprise fund is basically based off of your water usage. So they, are, they go hand in hand. And there is an opportunity for some economies of scale by having our own water department that currently does the billing on water do the billing for sewer. So I think that there are opportunities that we want to take advantage of as we move <coughs> forward. <clears throat> Ultimately, the committee put forth these concepts to the Board of Selectmen. And the Board of Selectmen, at one of their meetings, did vote formally, <coughs> and this is part of the actual plan, the, the components, now you guys have it in front of you, so I don't need to read it, but the, they adopted, the selectmen adopted the combination of the wastewater, um, wastewater property tax, the infra infrastructure investment fund, and the sewer enterprise based on water consumption, and where appropriate, the grant funds will be applied to, for, and if awarded, will be used to offset cost as applicable. This policy will be utilized to support the implementation at least for the first three phases of the eight-phase program and is subject to change should other potential beneficial funding programs become available to the town and actions of town meeting and subsequent ballots will be necessary. So now we have basically presented the program, they presented it to the board, and the board has officially adopted that and that's gone into the CWMP. This is where I just want to talk a little bit because I think that when people say there's a fluidity to this, you know, what does that mean? And I started about a little over two years ago and I started on, when I started, I got involved in the Muddy Creek Project. The Muddy Creek Project started off initially as a $3 million project. It went to a $6 million project. Here you can see in the early plan, they contemplated about $2 million. So we went from $2 million to $6 million. That's not good. That's not a good roadmap forward. However, because this had innovative elements that I think the state and the feds wanted to see, that the, the, a lot of the groups, I think the Pleasant Bay Alliance and other groups, I, I want to just point out Carol Ridley has done a tremendous amount of work in terms of securing grants on behalf of the town, that about $5 million worth of grants were secured on that project. So here we went from an estimate of two to three to six, and yet the net is only going to be one. Will that always be the case? Absolutely not. But I think it does say that in areas where we have those innovative technologies that we're going to use to help the environment, it means that we should actively pursue those. The other component is on uh, the, the phase two of this. You see the, the $24 million. That's really when we start doing the East Harwich. When we do the traditional model, if you would, of putting pipes in the ground and transporting the wastewater from here to the treatment facility in Chatham or a treatment facility in Dennis later on down the line, that, that kind of costs are going to be harder costs. I think the one real advantage, people say, oh, what is the SRF, State Revolving Loan Fund? And I think it's important to get a sense for what that is. It's actually almost a state bank that the state, many, many years ago, I think it was right around the time I started in this business, about 1990, created a State Revolving Loan Fund, and the state put money in, and they loaned that money to cities and towns to do water and then wastewater programs they charged a certain level of interest and that money goes back in and it gets reused for cities and towns. So it is a way to populate. And because it's a state program and a state funding source, what that gives us the opportunity, as you've heard, the borrowing rate is only 2%. So where if we went out to the marketplace and asked for a traditional borrowing for 
a general obligation bond, and we would pay 4% for 20 years, and probably even more if we went out to 30 or 40. By mass general law, you can go out to 40 years for some of these borrowings. Here, we have a mechanism to have a lot more control that we would know that the borrowings would stay at 2% or at 0%, depending on how that program runs. So it does give us a, a tremendous amount of flexibility. Okay. I just wanted to show this chart. This is the, uh, the current debt structure of the town. The dark blue shows our debt that's falling off. We use what's called a declining debt schedule. The biggest piece of that debt is the, really the Montemoy Regional School, which just came on. And what the concept is that I have, that I've put forth, and I've used this in, in another community, is when we have a debt level that's at a certain amount, if we backfill that debt, as that debt falls off, we replace it with something else. So the taxpayer right now is used to paying $4 million worth of the tax bill goes for debt service. How do we capture that and keep that at a certain level and reuse that? So in this case, convert it from school debt into sewer debt or wastewater debt. And that will give us the ability to kind of control some of the costs related to the program. So if we go to the next one. <clears throat> what, this, uh, what this slide shows is it has, here's if we had a, the debt service budget, as I alluded to, $4 million, and we had that targeted for a 3% increase per year. So we just run that at the same level that Proposition 2.5 generally runs. Then you can see where the line is. What we put here is that same chart that I just showed with a couple of the, the first three phases funded in here. And you can see we're not significantly out of whack. There's not going to be going from 4 million to 8 million. We will be able to manage how the debt is done. Actually, if we can go back one, too. I was asked to, to do this chart uh, earlier as part of the budget cycle. And one of the things I just want to point out, not necessarily directly related to this, but we assumed the Chatham IMA, we also assumed $7 million for the Sacquatucket Harbor. So that part of that chart shows $7 million for Sacquatucket Harbor. Due to the efforts of the harbor master, there was a $1 million grant that was obtained for that. And due to our review of the fee structure of the harbors, we plan on taking 75% of that general fund debt and putting it towards the ratepayers. So that chart here is really a worst case scenario where we just took $7 million and reduced that down significantly. And I think that's where this gives us the opportunity as we move forward to be able to manage the debt. I think it's hard to predict far out because like in the case I gave with the Muddy Creek, you never know what you're gonna end up with. I mean, there was really quite a bit that went into that, but we ended up as a net positive. So just to give you a little bit of a sense for, just to give you a little bit of a sense for how that debt service would be, would be handled. The other part that the, uh, the wastewater implementation folks did was just to give people a sense for how much would some of these things be to the average taxpayer in town. So based upon an assessed home value at 400,000, an FY15 property tax of 47 million with an increase of 2.5 and, and so on, they put certain assumptions in and they came up with, go ahead. They came up with a, a cost to the homeowners on sewer. And under this scenario, they use all three. So you could see $54 would come from the infrastructure investment fund. That would be a town-wide tax similar to the CPA. The property tax increase in the form of a debt exclusion would be about 133. And then in this model, they have sewer enterprise. And the total would be about $244. That also includes an initial hookup cost. and then. This all precludes any kind of O&M. So we're looking at the capital cost would be to build the infrastructure to do this, and then the actual treatment of the material that goes into the system still has to be paid. So that would be paid similar to your water bill in terms of that. You get a similar result from your water bill. 
and then not all town, not all homes in the community are going to be sewered because they don't need to be. We only need to treat a certain amount to get to the certain <coughs> TMDLs that were pointed out. So when we do about 50% of the town, there will be about 50% of the people that will not be on sewer. So we wanted to kind of highlight some of the, uh, the numbers here. And ironically, the numbers come in pretty similar. So because everybody contributes to the problem, you may not have necessarily some of those O&M costs, but you still have the costs that have been pointed out, the infrastructure costs. And that is about 244. So I wanted to try to make sure I kept mine uh, somewhat brief so we'd have enough time for the uh, exercise. So I'm going to uh, kind of knock off there. So the estimate is about 244 either direction. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, it's about 7.20, so if we want to try and stay on schedule, um, I think we have time for a couple questions, if anybody has any, and then we can take a short break so you can stretch and then get into the exercise. Yes, sir. No, it's just no cost listed. No cost listed on the hookup. We don't. Is there an S? No, what's shown in the comprehensive wastewater management plan is about thirty-five to forty-five hundred dollars per homeowner, depending on how they pay for it. One time charge to hook up. Yes. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Can you start the uh, enterprise fund immediately, or do you have to wait until you start to put shovels in the ground and form a plan? I think you can activate the enterprise fund early. Uh, the revenue source, obviously, it would have to be sewer related. So the money wouldn't come in unless it was linked to something that was specifically related to the wastewater program. Can everyone hear the questions, or should I repeat them? Well, for the These are working, right? Uh, uh, mics. Know, oh, for the, the oh, they hear the question. Yes, ma'am. Yes, per year, so per year. Sure. Thank you for the comment. Anyone else? All right. Well, then why don't we take a five-minute break and be back here by around 727, and then we can start. Thank you. Oh, that's right. Yeah.